Great, so well, it's an honor to be here, so thank you very much for having me. Um, and uh, the paper I'm going to be presenting to you is, as you see there, on the fiscal footprint of macroprudential policy. So it's a, I think it's a nice, snazzy title, but of course it requires explaining exactly what I mean by the fiscal footprint of macroprudential policy. So when it comes to discussing uh, monetary policy, so let's make it concrete in terms of if you cut interest rates, it's very well understood that if you cut interest rates, you're going to increase the demand for banknotes, and because of that demand, you will supply the central bank, and that will generate seniors' revenues. It is very well understood that if you cut interest rates unexpectedly, that may create some unexpected inflation that will lower the real value of the debt. It is very well understood that if you cut interest rates and the and this government has to roll over its debt right now, it will be easier to do so, since the price of government bonds are higher. And finally, that insofar as there is a Phillips curve, that if you cut interest rates and you generate unexpected inflation, you'll also raise economic activity and tax revenues. In other words, it's very clear, or at least very well understood among people in this room, that monetary policy has a fiscal footprint. Um, indeed, there's a whole literature, and even Francesco Bianchi's paper yesterday was one illustration of that literature, that talks about the problems of fiscal dominance, that is, to what extent inflation control sometimes gets sacrificed, and the fiscal footprint becomes not a side result of monetary policy, but rather the main focus of monetary policy. Okay? Moreover, in the study of Ramsey monetary and fiscal policy, it is a fundamental result in it that you want to have volatile and usually serially uncorrelated inflation in order to precisely generate some of this fiscal footprint and be able in doing so to smooth taxation. Although the response to that in the world has been that given a lack of commitment by the central bank, and Ken Rogoff already mentioned some of these commitment problems um, relating to his work in 1985, that sometimes having an independent or maybe conservative or a central bank that has intermediate targets may be a better outcome than to exploit that fiscal footprint. In other words, the fiscal footprint of monetary policy is a well understood topic in many different ways. What I want to ask in this paper is what about macroprudential policy? Central banks nowadays and over the last 10 years have become increasingly in charge of macroprudential policy. And I want to ask precisely the same questions that have been convincingly answered in the monetary policy literature in the last 30 years. Namely, or to start and for my, uh, the 32 minutes I have with you, what are the channels? In the same way that I could easily list five channels in my first slide and you all nodded politely or dozed off a little because they are all so well known. I want to ask, what are the channels of macroprudential policy? Try to characterize them, see what they are. To understand the to what extent can we have an interaction between fiscal and financial crisis to the point where there will be fiscal dominance over macroprudential policy as opposed to fiscal dominance over monetary policy, or not as opposed, but as a complement, perhaps. In particular, to what extent can we have, in the celebrated words of Tom Sarge and Neil Wallace, an unpleasant macroprudential arithmetics where macroprudential policy becomes the dominant force. Um, so those are the questions that I want to ask. These are questions that talk to some policy debates, so let me at least refer some of the applications, I think, of some of the issues that I will raise. Recently, during the run-up to the Indian elections, there was a lot of pressure and a lot of discussion in Indian media on how the government was putting a lot of pressure on the RBI, the Reserve Bank of India, to relax lending requirements produce a bit of a credit boom and help get reelected. Nothing different from those of us who have read exactly Alezina, Tabellini, and all these many papers on political business cycles of the late 80s. A second policy debate is to what extent should the macro pre regulator be inside the central bank or in the treasury? Countries differ widely in terms of this. Um, in some countries, macro prudential is the, ex the exclusive responsibility of the central bank. In some, they're exclusively an independent agency. Well, understanding to what extent they have a very big fiscal footprint should at least guide some of that answer. Like Ken Rogoff was saying just a couple of hours ago or an hour ago, um, of course, monetary policy has a fiscal footprint, but we have, for the arguments that I put in the previous slide, thought that the monetary dominance is probably the best regime, and as a result, we've placed monetary policy independently from the fiscal authority. When it comes, if the fiscal footprint becomes very, very large, then central bank independence is a charge and we should put it in the treasury. What about macroprudential policy? Should it belong, if it has a large fiscal footprint, it should be in the treasury. If it's small relative to others, maybe it should be in the central bank. And finally, and again relating to this question, if we have a central bank that's independent, like the Bank of England with a financial um, uh, policy committee, 
yeah, so the Macroprudential Financial Policy Committee, to what extent are we compromising its independence precisely because there's a very large fiscal footprint, which means that this, this, this committee, there will be a big temptation to override it. So those are the questions that I want to answer. That's the motivation in different ways. Now, these are very, very big questions, so this is at best a, a modest contribution to these debates. So let me tell you what I will try to do in this paper. In this paper, I'm going to focus on two things. First, and I'm going to restrict them, and you're totally fine in the questions that tell me, oh, but I think it would be more interesting to do other things. But these are the ones I'm going to do. First, I'm going to restrict on the policy tool being the amount of government bonds that the macroprudential regulator forces banks to hold. I'm going to call that beta, and beta will be, I think, in every slide. So that is going to be the key policy tool. Strictly speaking, you can think about these as liquidity requirements, or more strictly even reserve requirements, if you extend government liabilities to include uh, reserves of the central bank, like Ken was mentioning earlier. Okay? So you can think about these as being the two macro tools that I'm going to be addressing directly. Now, more generally, though, um, most macroprudential policies, and as you, many of you know, there's a wide variety of them, tend to have an effect of increasing the demand that banks have for safety because they are um, designed to increase the safety of those banks. In doing so, you can think of beta as a proxy variable for a series of these policies through this dimension of to what extent they increase or change or lower beta. Moreover, and thirdly, for the question that I want to ask, that feature, forcing banks to hold more government bonds or less, is the one that, historically, is often the one where the independence gets lost, where the fiscal concerns override those of the central bank. And so that's why I thought this was a good place to start. Second focus, my focus is going to be on the fiscal burden, that is, on the resources that the governments raise, and to what extent does macroprudential policy increase that burden, has a positive footprint, steps on the burden, or has a negative footprint, that is, it releases that burden, if you want. Okay? You have a positive view, tighten the government budget constraint. There are a lot of other, if you want, fiscal implications of macroprudential policy. For instance, there's a very wide, large macroprudential literature that thinks about Pigouvian taxes. Enrique Mendoza, for instance, has worked on some of this. That whole literature, I think without almost an exception, has no impact on the government budget constraint because then there's some lump sum tax to redistribute the resources. The question is to distort margins, as in Pigou's analysis, not on the overall government budget constraint. Likewise, there's a macroprudential literature on redistribution that policies like loan-to-value ratios and others have between different members of the population. Again, these, may, these are about redistributions within the population, not about whether the overall budget constraint got tighter or looser. And so that's the sense in which my title, while SASI was, I think, accurate in terms of what I'll actually do. Finally, just in terms of literature review, since I mentioned some, let me mention it just in five seconds, I'm going to build my model of bond market on work by Annette and others. My model of banks is going to be built a lot on work by Patrick Bolt and Olivier Jean. My work on linking fiscal and financials builds on work of Mike Bordeaux and others. And finally, my model diabolic loop is going to build on Farhi and Tirol. So those are the last reference I'll make to the literature, but I'm certainly building on different theories out there and combine them to try to answer this question. So let me start. I'm going to, start, I'm going to do three things. First, I'm going to write a model of the bond market and define an object called the, the direct fiscal footprint and characterize that. Then I'm going to write a model of general equilibrium, if you want, or of financial markets. And I'm going to define what I'm going to call an indirect fiscal footprint. And third, I'm going to apply this to different circumstances, different combinations of financial fiscal conflicts to try and learn how these channels reveal themselves differently. Okay? So, bond market. I'm going to have a demand and a supply. The demand curve is going to say that the price of a bond, actually, usually this works better, Q, the price of the government bonds, is not going to be just equal to 1 over the yield on, say, a deposit or on a financial market. It's going to differ from it from two ways. Think about this as a deposit rate, if you want. First, there could be default. Delta is going to be the payment. If the face value of bond is 1, delta is what share of 1 gets paid. Okay? And so that would lower the price of the bond or increase its yield relative to, the, the inter, to a shadow interest rate say, set by the central bank. Second, there's going to be a convenience, if you want, uh, yield or a um, 
some utility that arises from holding bonds that is positive but declining. That is, if you want that the price of government bonds is going to exceed what you would get from a simple arbitrage relation because these bonds are providing some service to you. Now, one can write a problem uh, to justify this, but, I'll just, but the problem is really just justifying what I've told you in words. So let's just focus on that. Okay? And this builds again. Annette has done quite a bit of work on measuring these different functions and what, how they look like. What about the supply for bonds? The government issues capital B. The banks hold this little b. And then on top of it, the central bank buys some of them by issuing reserves, quantitative easing if you want. And finally, a macroprudential regulator is going to set this minimum beta that banks have to hold. Banks, because they, earn, they have to pay something like close to the deposit rate to their investors, but they have to hold these government bonds that have a lower yield, would like, in this very simple extreme model, to hold zero bonds at all. But if the microproof says you have to hold at least beta bonds, they're going to hold exactly beta bonds. Okay? Now, combine supply and demand, and you can pin down what the equilibrium price of the bond is against how many bonds are being held by the private sector, that is the non-financial private sector. Okay? That's the demand curve and the supply curve. What happens then if you have a macroprudential policy that raises beta? Well, the supply curve shifts to the left. Less bonds have to be held by the non-financial sector. The price of bonds goes up. The price of bonds goes up even as precisely this uh, convenience yield of the bonds, if you want, as fewer are being held, can now be higher. Okay? Or the convenience part of that. Note that unconventional monetary policy, that is an increase in the reserves issued by a central bank and the bonds it buys, has exactly the same effect of raising the same Q, but now differently in that the implications for, even though the shift of the supply is the same, the implication now is that it's the banks as opposed who's holding the extra bonds is it the households versus the central banks. And that's the only way in which it differs, but the impact on price is the same. And that leads then to, well, if we've done macro pro and QE, why not just do conventional monetary policy? A cut in interest rates is nothing but instead a shift of the demand to the right, which results equally as well as an increase in the price of the bonds. Even if, again, now this comes with no change in the, uh, in the liquidity benefits or safety benefits of holding government bonds. Okay? Oops. Okay. So that's macro pro in a very simple sense what beta does to Q, the price, of the, the price of the bonds. Let's think about then what's the fiscal footprint or the fiscal implications of this. If the government budget constraints that the government collects some fiscal surpluses, some dividends from the government, and issues these bonds, then simply writing the intertemporal version of this, we have that the government, conditional on future borrowing, has to raise fiscal surpluses to pay for the old bonds coming due once subtracted from the dividends paid by the central bank. What do I, this is the fiscal burden, that is how much fiscal surplus you have to raise in order to pay your past debts as well as your past lower surpluses or others. The direct fiscal footprint of a policy is then the change on this right-hand side. There's a change in how much, sur how much surplus you have to raise. First result then, tighter macroprudential policy has a negative direct fiscal footprint. Why? Macroprudential policy, by raising the price of the bonds, makes it easier for the government to finance itself, to roll over the bonds from the previous period. And insofar as, insofar as it has bonds to roll over, the fact that there's this effect on the price is going to alleviate the constraints facing the government. But because we have also, because my very, very simple model of the bond markets also has monetary policy both in its convention and unconventional forms, I can ask how does macro proof compare with monetary and uh, unconventional and conventional monetary in this regard. And the way I'm going to normalize is by saying, imagine that, precisely as why I made you go through this diagram, I think of these three policies having the same impact on the bonds. If they have the same impact on the bonds, I'm going to call them identical price impact policies. How do they differ in terms of the fiscal footprint? And the answer is they all have the exact same effect on the rollover of the debt, but on top of it, conventional monetary policy also has an extra negative fiscal footprint because it generates inflation that inflates away some of the debt. Therefore, conventional monetary policy always has a bigger direct fiscal footprint than what macro does.
Unconventional monetary policy, on the other hand, is going to affect the liquidity premium between reserves opposed to government bonds. Maybe that's positive, maybe that's negative. Likely it's very small. And it's going to have an effect insofar as if the central bank is holding the bonds and the bonds default, this is going to um, have an impact on the government budget constraint because the government is going to receive less dividends from the central bank. Either way, even though these are different, the conclusion is that the effect of them, how much can you inflate away the debt, how much is the change in relative liquidity premium, and how much is the effect of unexpected default, are all likely relatively small. So that in terms of direct fiscal footprint, all three policies are likely very small, although conventional monetary policy is the one that unambiguously dominates the other two when it comes to creating a fiscal footprint, which perhaps may be why in fiscal crisis, as we well know from the work of Philip Kagan, 70 years ago and, other, and many others, it's often the first line of defense when do fiscal dominance steps in, and as in, say, uh, Francesco's work yesterday. Second point, let me write, let me, let me build up the model the bond market to put in a model general equilibrium to talk about the indirect fiscal footprint. So I'm going to think about a model in which, let me tell you a little bit of the, of the, of the feature of the model, there's going to be some entrepreneurs that have ideas, they'd like to fund them, but they have no capital, so they have to go and raise capital. If I raise capital today to produce tomorrow, that has some cost. There's some amount of capital I need to raise that is profitable. The economy would like to do this. We'd like to do all this financing ex ante through regular investment, finance today, produce tomorrow. Because of financial frictions, which I'll describe soon, not all entrepreneurs get financed today. If we enter tomorrow, that is the date of production, we still have a chance to finance production. It's just that at that point, the cost of doing so through what I'm going to call make-do capital is higher. So if total production, in terms of these setup costs, are such that we end up funding these number of firms, the first firms are funded one period before, ex ante, at a low cost. The other ones are funded ex post. Okay. What that's going to generate is that there's a demand for capital both ex ante and ex post. Ex ante, we have banks or bankers whose great skill is they are able to monitor entrepreneurs and collect payment. They have some net worth and they collect deposits in order to fund both their investment, their credit in these firms, as well as how many bonds the, the macroprudential regulator forced them to hold. The financial constraint is the very classic, I don't even know who invented it first, but if you've read Kiyotaki, Gertler, Moore type papers, you've seen this a million times which is that maybe the banks can run away with their share of the loan, some share one minus gamma, because of that. But if they stay, they have to pay the deposits, but they can keep the bonds that could get seized, as well as all of the residual. This is going to imply essentially a leverage constraint on the banks in terms of how many deposits they can raise. But there's then a third agent, and these I'm going to call them financiers, for lack of a better word. They had some net worth, so the banks wanted to finance everything in pure T, and this regular investment is cheaper. But there were these financiers that couldn't quite find, couldn't quite, they couldn't quite get the modern technology to make loans, so they reach the ex post period and they're stuck with this capital. What can they do then? Well, they can lend it in, in the interbank market to um, the bankers, who can then lend it through this make do capital to finance production of those firms. Okay? The friction there is, though, that this requires posting collateral, posting margin. For a financier to lend to a bank, it needs to post margin. And this is what generates a demand for the bonds by these banks. The banks need to hold bonds so that in the next period, they're able to borrow from the financiers and finance make do capital. Okay? However, there is a moral hazard in this problem. And the moral hazard is that if the banks did not hold enough bonds to finance the capital, the efficient level of capital, then because that is socially optimal, the government will step in and bail out. That is, it will su sustain the efficient level of capital and cover any difference between that and the amount of interbank lending that happens. Okay? As a result, and because the banks really love making regular investment, which is more profitable, they would like to hold zero bonds, reach the next period, and then say the interbank market is collapsing, it's crashing, please government, come and bail us out so that we can keep the interbank market going and make new investment. Okay? So all I'm trying to do in this model is to generate both a demand for the government bonds, and especially a moral hazard problem such that the banks don't want to be too risky, they want to be bailed out ex post. Okay, and I've done it in a fairly stark and extreme way. Now, 
what are the tax revenues of the, of, in this economy? Well, the government, since the only real decision here is whether to invest or not, I'm going to tax that decision. That's the only real decision here. I'm going to tax the regular investors or tax the make-do investors in terms of their profit. I'm going to allow to expense their investment costs. The bailouts I've already defined. So what's primary surplus? Revenues minus taxes minus, I'm going to allow for some exogenous government purchases. What's the indirect fiscal footprint? Essentially, it's the term that I was missing from the government budget constraint, which is if I control a tax rate, a tau, if you want, here, then to what extent does the tax base or the bailout cost change and in doing so force me to raise the taxes? So those are not directly, that is, these are the effects on the fiscal surplus itself. Again, if this was a monetary paper, this would be the Phillips curve part as opposed to the other part. Okay? Now, in this model, what are the costs and benefits of macro pro? On the one hand, because the banks don't want to hold bonds, the fiscal benefit of macro pro is that if I make them hold bonds, I lower the incidence of financial crisis, times in which they don't have enough bonds to sustain the interbank market investment, and if a crisis happens, I lower how much I need to bail them out. Again, what does macro pro do? Make the financial system safer, and in case of crashes that may happen, make sure that the government doesn't have to spend too much money bailing it out. What are the costs of macro pro, though, is that by making banks hold bonds, we make banks less profitable. We make banks be, have less ability to give credit to, a, to firms, as well as less will, able to collect deposits. And as such, we contract investment, which means contracting real activity and tax revenues in the next period. And so that's a trade-off between macro pro. What's in the indirect fiscal footprint is precisely the difference between the effect on the bailouts, the good effect, and the effect on the revenues, the bad effect on the real activity. Okay? So, yeah? So, to, um, to restate, I've stated three channels for macroprudential policy. A direct effect on bond pricing rolling over the debt, and now two indirect effects, one positive and one negative, in that macropro on the, other hand, on the one hand reduces the incidence of financial crisis and their cost, but on the other hand, lowers the average level of real activity and thus lowers the average tax revenues of the government. How do these interact now? And I'm going to consider four cases because I'm going to consider whether there is a fiscal crisis, a financial crisis, neither or both. A fiscal crisis here is a point in which the government defaults, essentially pays less in the face of the debt. A financial crisis is a time when we have to bail out banks. Okay? The, the interbank market froze, we had to call the government. First case, what happens if there's no fiscal or financial crisis? Well, then, tighter macro pro, on the one hand, crowds out lending, which has a positive fiscal footprint, that is, makes the job of the government harder. On the other hand, okay, if there's no fiscal or financial crisis, it makes it easier for the government to roll over its debt. One direct and one indirect effect, with both of which I've characterized, and which go in opposite directions. Okay? As a macro pool regulator, I tell the banks, you have to hold the bonds. You, the Treasury Minister, says, great, I can roll over my bonds today. But then tomorrow, of course, there's less real activity, you're going to collect less tax revenues. Okay? Depending on which of these effects is bigger, that's the condition with the scary looking terms here. It could either be positive or negative. But let's apply this, because I want to apply these four cases to try to reflect a little bit about some of the experience of um, in economic history. Imagine that as a ma politician, if you want, policymaker, I care a lot about the present and less so about the future. I have a certain extent of present bias. This could either be because of myopia or some form of, let's not call it rationality, but behavioral economics, or it could be simply because of turnover in the government. We know very well that from the work of many people, including Pierre, that high electoral turnover is often associated with what seems like prize and bias politicians who lead to higher debt um, and less um, higher debt and less fiscal discipline. Well, in the case of macroprudential policy, if these present bias politicians are in charge, they will want tighter macro pro because I can roll over the debt now easier. I just tell the banks you have to hold my bonds, and then yes, tomorrow I'm going to have less fiscal revenues. But that's tomorrow's problem. That's the problem of the next government, probabilistically speaking. Okay? Well, when we look at Latin America in the 1980s, we look at many countries. I don't know about Chile, but I know I read, I read enough about Brazil and Colombia and Mexico to be able to say this, that 
reserve requirements were very large and very actively used as a form of precisely helping the government fight what were recurrent debt crisis. And the central bank, in this case, it wasn't even the central bank. It was just whatever was the macro proof financial regulator was essentially subordinated to the fiscal needs when it came to setting these reserve requirements in order to prevent the, in order to at least delay the fiscal crisis, which of course was invariably inevitable, just as in present biased models of debt and uh, fiscal policy. Case number two, what if there's a fiscal crisis? Then the effects are exactly the same in the previous proposition. That is, as it turns out, it's all about essentially to what extent is the impact of the tighter macro pru versus uh, the impact tighter macro pru allowing me to roll over the debt versus the impact it has on tax revenues. There's no financial crisis, so the impact on less bailouts is still not there yet. Again, though, let's apply this to try and make a little bit of sense to these simple insights to make, try to make sense of some economic history. Imagine that I'm a fiscal authority that commits to low taxes. I will just not raise the taxes anymore. Or imagine I'm a fiscal authority where we've just elected someone who is unable to control their spending. Or even that we've learned that the debt is higher than before. Either way, these are all commitment, purposeful or not, to say that we are going to be unable to generate the fiscal revenues to prevent a fiscal crisis. In this circumstance, the macroprudential regulator will want to avoid the fiscal crisis. We're still in the range where no financial crisis will come. We had enough financial buffers. It will then follow that the macroprudential regulator will want to use its fiscal footprint, which again, depending on what could mean tighter or looser, in order to essentially tax the financial system. So the unpleasant monetarist arithmetics that again, Sargent and Wallace talked about works exactly the same way with macroprudential authorities. If simply you don't have enough fiscal revenues and a financial crisis is something distant in the horizon, then you will want to, the fiscal authority will want to indeed pursue potentially irresponsible fiscal plans and tell the macro pro regulator, you go and help me out of this bind now by making it easier for me to sell the government bond, say. Or if you want, engage in macro financial policy then becomes financial repression as a revenue generating tool. Third case, what if there's a financial crisis, but no fiscal crisis? Then in that case, the case for tighter macro pru is larger. Why? Because now there's a third effect, which is, of course, tighter macro pru lowers the cost that comes with the financial crisis, lowers the size of the bailout. Let me apply this to the more recent uh, experience, in particular the last 10 years. Following the financial crisis, almost every financial center in a and this, um, almost every financial center in the world has had tighter macroprudential policies and equally important macroprudential authorities arising that are independent from the treasury, either because of macroprudential po powers being given to central banks or because of new institutions being set up. Why? Why, is, why has this happened in the last 10 years? Because in the last 10 years, the interests of the fiscal authority and the regulator have been perfectly aligned. The fear is of a new financial crisis. The, ma the regulator wants to, wants to prevent it because that's its job. The fiscal wants to prevent it because those are very costly, as we learned to clean up in the last, in the last crisis or in, even in crisis before us. There's no conflict. As such, the fiscal authorities are, have been very happy to delegate macroprudential powers to central banks or other independent agencies. Not so in the 1980s when the fiscal crisis was the relevant one, and instead I wanted to have unpleasant macroprudential arithmetics and take control of the macroprudential authority. Fourth and final case, the twin crisis. Let me write the model. The model turns out the equilibrium for how much default there is and how much bailout there is is given by the combination of the needs for bailout investment and the budget constraint in the government. They're both downward sloping lines. Why? If you have a higher bailout T, you have more fiscal spending, that means you're going to have more defaults, smaller delta, smaller payment on government debt. At the same time, if you have more default, lower delta, it means that the value of collateral, the amount of safe assets in the economy, are scarcer, which makes it more likely that the interbank market is going to freeze and you're going to have a higher bailout. Okay? So the equilibrium is then some, some extent of financial crisis, some extent of fiscal crisis. In this circumstance, what happens when there's an increase in public spending? An increase in public spending, this is why we needed the G, 
is a shift of the budget constraint down, a parallel shift. If there was no financial crisis, this would imply a worse, um, yeah. So then we would be here in the vertical axis, and this would imply a certain extent of fiscal crisis, a change in delta. Because of the downward sloping red line, because we're not in intercept, but we're, at, at, we're not in the vertical axis, we're instead at the intercept, you see that the effect is larger, significantly larger. And why is that? Because this model has this feature of the so-called diabolic loop. When the government defaults, that lowers the amount of safe assets in the interbank market, that leads to a freezing of interbank market and credit there, which of course then leads to higher bailouts, which makes the position, fiscal position of the government worse, which leads to more of a default, and so on. And so you can see the loop here very neatly. It's simply the reason why this movement is more than vertical. You go further down. You move also along here. Okay? Note that if macroprudential is higher, there's higher beta, what that means is that the red line is flatter. And that means that the amplification is now larger. Why? The more bonds the banks hold, the stronger the, macro, the, the diabolic loop effect is. Second, what happens if we have, uh, what happens, why is this here? What happens if we have tighter macro prudential policy? Now, in terms of the budget constraint, a higher beta will just imply that you're going to have less fiscal resources. Um, le you're going to have the, those direct fiscal footprint impacts, which means that you potentially have, um, in this case, um, a tightening of the budget constraint. It could be loosening or tightening. But now, if you have the bailout investment, what that implies is that, on the one hand, you have this impact of the tighter macro pool, in this case, is making the job harder uh, or the resources of the government being smaller, that was the green effect. But on top of it, you have the diabolic loop making this bigger than before. But of course, at the same time, because you've had tighter macro pro, it also implies that you're getting this positive fiscal footprint from the fact that you have, or because of the banks are now holding a higher beta, you've been able to roll over more of your debt. So overall, the effect may be bigger or smaller. Here, I drew it as if it was exactly the same. So the diabolic loop, on the one hand, makes the impact bigger, but on the other hand, the fact that you've now made the banks hold more bonds means that you're gonna have less of a bailout, and as a result, less of an attenuation. Let me apply this now to the situation of Europe, my fourth case, and thus my fourth application. The sovereign debt crisis of 2012 had the diabolic loop at its center, according to now a wide literature. A big discussion in the European in the euro area has been to what extent to introduce concentration limits on the amount of national debt. That is, say that an Italian bank cannot hold more than a share of its assets in Italian bonds. And or on the Basel III rules that say that if an Italian bank holds Italian bonds, those receive a zero risk weight and therefore it becomes very cheap to hold these very risky assets and earn their risky return while paying zero regulation cost. The argument in favor of these policies is this picture which is let's have, in this case, lower beta, lower macro pro over these banks. But here, remember, beta is nothing but how many bonds do the Italian banks hold? Right now, because of moral suasion, regulation of their regulators, they hold a lot of them. Because they hold a lot of them, the diabolic loop is very large. Moving this, imposing concentration limits and putting zero risk weight, would be steepening the red line, making the diabolic loop smaller, preventing the financial stability that came with 2010. And so that's the argument for why to do those policies. But what about the argument against them? And the argument against them ends up being the one on the other picture. And that is that if the government can, if the Italian government can force the banks to hold more of its bonds, it can have a very nice fiscal footprint. I can use my pulse or moral suasion to fill my fiscal shortfalls, I can take advantage of macroprudential and pleasant arithmetics to, if I'm in Italy, prevent potential default because I can just use that fiscal footprint. And so the model neatly captures this discussion as well. So in my last 53 seconds, let me summarize what I, the points I tried to make in this paper. I want to start thinking about the fiscal footprint of macroprudential policy to better understand its independence, its role in terms of institutional design even, in terms of where it should be placed. To do so, I wrote a very simple model because I just want, I wanted to highlight some channels and their interaction. Fiscal, 
Tighter macroprudential policy makes rolling over the debt cheaper, but it also lowers lending, real activity, and tax collection in the future while lowering bailout costs and their likelihood. Compared with monetary policy, macroprud has a lower fiscal footprint. So from that perspective, it, sorry, has a lower direct fiscal footprint. That's important. So from that perspective, if we're in a world in which we're ignoring the indirect effects, then if we have a present biased politician, like in my first case, you prefer to tell the central bank to print a lot of money rather than to just tell it use macro pru or not. However, if we have an independent macro pru regulator that interacts with the fiscal authority, then unpleasant macro prudential arithmetics may arise. They may not arise as they haven't in the last five or 10 years. Because of course, if your objectives are aligned, then you're very happy to delegate power if you're the fiscal authority to the macro pru regulator, and there's really no bite in doing so. But in other circumstances, there will be unpleasant macroprudential arithmetics, meaning the fiscal authority will want to take over. And moreover, if you have the diabolic loop at play, if the interaction with financial fiscal crises are important, then you end up with the fact that macroprudential policy may, um, or the macroprudential regulator may want to lower the volatility that it comes associated with crisis, while the fiscal authority wants instead to have access to it to an easy way to tax the banks in order to prevent a crisis in the first place. Thank you.